and welcome everyone to this uh, Linnaean Society lunch lecture. Um, I'm, I'm very emotional, actually. I'm, I'm so excited to welcome Zephyr here. As Padma mentioned, I'm Tunisian. I work uh, as a plant scientist in the Sense Lab in Norwich. So I've been here in UK for many years now, but um, my roots are in, in, in Tunisia, and that's where I grew up, and that's where I became passionate about biology. I connected with uh, Zecher and the uh, ATVS. These are the French acronym for the Tunisian Wildlife Society. Uh, I connected with uh, with Zecher and that gang. Uh, in fact, during the um, pandemic lockdowns, um, you know, we had time to browse the internet and all of that. And I um, connected with uh, with this team, and I uh, since uh, had the opportunity to meet them in Tunis a couple of times. A very exciting group of young people who um, have been doing really amazing things in a, in a region that's not so far from here. I mean, keep in mind, Tunis is only two hour, 40 minute flight from, from London. And I'm looking here at the gray weather out of my window. Uh, it's currently 24 um, and sunny in, in, in Tunis. So very different, uh, very different environment. Um, and um, yeah, despite despite the uh, how close how close Tunisia is to the UK, uh, I don't think it's very well known from the perspective of natural history. So hopefully, uh, Zecher's uh, presentation will inspire you to go on some bird watching tour or botanizing tours or whatever you you love to do there. Because uh, just from you know a few hour flight, you can really discover a very different um, ecosystems and very different fauna and flora. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing I want to say is I, I'm very jealous of Zecher and 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 his his teammates because when I grew up, I was very passionate about biology as a teenager in in Tunisia and and uh, but I I never found anyone who shared my passion. So um, I, I'm I'm very jealous that uh, this group has really uh, gotten together and 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 built uh, a community and worked together to to really. Um, bring to the forefront the importance of biodiversity in, in, in Tunisia and the region. So uh, with that, uh, I just want to encourage you also to ask uh, questions using the Q&A, as Padma said. I will moderate the discussion later on, but uh, with that, Zeher, it's all yours. Welcome to the Linnaean Society. Thank you very much, Sofian, for the introduction, and um, thank you for your kind words. So my name is Zeher. I'm, uh, I'm the vice president of the Tunisian Association for Wildlife. And I'm currently now in the University of Wisconsin-Madison conducting my research on bioacoustic and how to use acoustic indices and machine learning to study ecosystem uh, health in a way. So I am delighted to have you all here with me today for this presentation. I extend my sincere gratitude to the Leninian Society for the invitation. I'm eager to share with you all about the Tunisian Association for Wildlife and what we have done so far. During this talk, I'll begin by taking you through a brief history of wildlife in North Africa, focusing on Tunisia, different civilizations, where we will then explore the diverse ecosystem found in Tunisia and its biodiversity, then we mention some of the challenges facing wildlife in there. Finally, we will discuss the Tunisian Association for Wildlife and our various activity and our role in wildlife conservation. As we journey to the North African region, we uncover a tapestry of woven with the threads of countless civilizations, the Capetian, the Phoenician, the Romans, the Amazigh, the Arab, the Ottoman Turks, and the French have each made their mark on this land, leaving behind an enduring legacy that is evident in Tunisia's uh, vibrant culture, architecture, and heritage. All of these civilizations have played a vital role in shaping Tunisia into the remarkable country it is today, and for sure their relationship with wildlife and their surrounding was different from one culture to another. First, there was the Capetian culture, the last known hunter gathered in the Maghreb region who thrived from approximately 8,000 BCE to 2,700 BCE. Their lives were intimately interwined with the wildlife of the region, as we can see in this petroglyph of a possibly sleeping antelope located at the Tassili Najjar in southern Algeria, which is pretty similar to southern Tunisia, offer a glimpse into the lifestyle of the Capsian people. Also, as you can see as well from the same region, what it could be a hunting scene maybe of a Barbary sheep. 
Then came the Phoenician, a civilization of seafaring people inhabited Tunisia and other parts of the Mediterranean region from around 2500 BC to 64 BC. They were skilled fishermen and played a significant role in the history of North Africa and the wider Mediterranean. The Phoenician undoubtedly had a considerable impact on the environment and wildlife of Tunisia through their fishing and trade activities. As you can see in here, a fragment of a floor mosaic from Utica depicts a fishing scene with anthrax detail. Utica was one of the main cities during the Phoenician uh, period in Tunisia. Venetians uh, or uh, amphitheater were a staple of entertainment in the Roman Empire, and Tunisia as a province of the empire would have been no exception. The holding of these spectacles would have contributed to the depletion of wildlife in Tunisia, with animals captured and brought from the rest parts of Africa and other parts of the empire for use in, in this event. The spectacles were staged for the entertainment of the citizen and symbolize Rome's politics and power. Some battles are known for having hundreds of animals. Yeah, the the, Mag the Majoris mosaic is a Roman floor mosaic discovered in the Tunisian village of Smirat. It contains two long inscriptions which reveal how entertainment was put on in a Roman amphitheater, now on display at the Seuss Archaeological Museum. The elliptic from form suggests the theater shape. This is the only known mosaic where there is an illustration of the scene joined with an explanatory text. It is believed that the Roman history played a big role in leading with the extinction of the North African carnival. The last Atlas bear was killed in 1870 in the mountain in North Morocco. Lion Atlas in Tunisia has been seen ever around, every, even around the 1920s from the local locality of Hydra in the west of the country and Atlas leopard may be persisted until the 1970 in the North African region. Tunisia is home to an incredible diversity of ecosystems. Starting from the north and moving south, we encounter the Mediterranean coast ecosystem where vegetation and rocky cliffs thrive in a humid and semi-humid climate. In the northwest of the country, there is a dominance of cork forests, mostly following the Mediterranean coastlines and going a little deep into the land over the mountain chain of Khmer. All over the north, we also encounter pine forests and eucalyptus forests, which were introduced in Tunisia during the colonial period and has been kept as part of the reforestation strategy until today. Also, following the coastline, Tunisia had 230 wetlands, forming an important passage for migratory birds from Africa to Europe and, and Europe to Africa. They represent the last resort for birds before starting their journey over the Mediterranean Sea, going to Europe, and the first resting point for them coming back to Africa. Eshkel is one of the largest lakes that is subscribed as a UNESCO natural heritage and harbor thousands of migratory birds each year. Yet in the last few years, we have noticed a substantial reduction in their numbers. Moving further inland, we find the semi-arid plains of northern Tunisia with hills, savanna, and sub scrubland. The rugged terrain of the Tilian Atlas Mountain includes forests of oak species, as well as meadows and scrublands. The central Tunisia plateau is relatively flat with fertile soil, making it ideal to agriculture and home to olive plantations. Moving south, we found the arid plain and rocky outcrop of the Sahara ecosystem is characterized by hot and arid conditions with sparse vegetation, sand dunes, and occasionally oasis. In Tunisia, there are over 148 protected areas, whether marine protected area or national park, Ramsar area, national reserve. And in Tunisia, there is the only single and last par national park that still have the uh, African savanna ecosystem in the North African region, which is the Bohedma National Park. The distribution of biodiversity hotspot and area of high rarity in Tunisia follows a distinct north to south gradient with the most diverse and important area being uh, located along the coast while the level of diversity and rarity decrease as you move southeast. However, it is important to know that this pattern of biodiversity distribution also overlaps with area of high human pressure, particularly related to agriculture, irrig irrigated uh, um, uh, agriculture and rain fed agriculture are two of the main um, human activity that can have a significant, significant impact on biodiversity in Tunisia, as they often evolve to the, involves the conversion of natural habitats 
into farmland and the use of pesticide and other chemical that can degrade, degrade soil and water quality. The country's location on the north coast of Africa at the interface between the Mediterranean and the Sahara has resulted in a unique blend of flora and fauna. For example, many of the plant species found in Tunisia are typically of the Mediterranean region, including olive tree, cork, oak, and pines, while others are adapted to the arid condition of the Sahara, such as acacias and tamarics. We also can find gazelles, oryx, and fenex, but also trepid hyena and Eurasian otters. The rich biodiversity heritage is often overlooked or neglected. Many of these ecosystems are under threat from humans' activities such as overfishing, deforestation, and urbanization, or threatened by industrial activity like in the Gulf of Gabus. The, this heritage is neglected in several ways. One of the main reasons is the lack of awareness and appreciation of the value of biodiversity among the general public and decision makers. This has led to a lack of investment in conservation effort, resulting in insufficient resources for protected areas, monitoring and research. Another reason in, uh, is this unsustainable use of natural resources such as overfishing, deforestation, and illegal fishing and overgrazing, which are causing significant damage to ecosystem and biodiversity in the region. In addition, there are challenges related to the weak enforcement uh, of laws and regulation, illegal wildlife trade, and the loss of traditional knowledge and practices related to biodiversity conservation. Illegal wildlife trade occur in daylight in known locations, but no measures are taken to stop this trend, despite the fact that Tunisia is one of the countries who agreed on the CITES Convention. This is Henry Normand. Uh, now Henry Normand's contribution to entomology and taxonomy in North Africa during the last, late 19th and early 20th centuries were extensive and valuable. His work focused mainly on Coleoptera and insects and is considerable, considered the most comprehensive in the region. While there were a few taxonomic studies conducted by Normand and other naturalists during the colonial period, not many studies went beyond taxonomy to address questions related to population dynamic, habitat, mo habitat modeling, or movement ecology. Also, the absence of academic programs in ecology, conservation, and wildlife management in Tunisia has resulted in a lack of expertise in this field. Without such program, aspiring students do not have the opportunity to learn about the latest development and techniques in the field, which can have a major impact on the conservation efforts in the country. Additionally, the lack of job opportunity in conservation makes it challenging for grad students to find meaningful work uh, in the field. As a response to all these challenges and gaps, we established the Tunisian Association for Wildlife, which is a non-governmental organization established in 2018 by a group of young researchers with the aim of supporting biodiversity conservation in Tunisia uh, the Tunisian Association for, Wild Association for Wildlife vision is the, to study and promote biodiversity through an ecosystem approach for conservation and awareness purposes to achieve. This vision association has set three objectives. The first one, contribute to the establishment of qualitative and quantitative inventory of biodiversity, to contribute to the valorization and protection of biodiversity using ecosystemic approaches and to contribute to raising public awareness about the importance of biodiversity in Tunisia. Currently, we currently have 15 volunteer members with professional team of multidisciplinary expert and has completed a cumulative total of 15 projects since its inception. During its four years of work, the association has established various official partnerships, including a convention with general direction forest, the Diversity Management and Conservation Biological System Research Laboratory at the Faculty of Sciences of Tunis, the Insectarium Isapolis in Italy, and many other collaborations. Also, since its creation, the Tunisian Association for Wildlife organized over 75 missions of biodiversity inventory over 350 different localities in Tunisia. The main purpose of these missions is to collect specimen for identification and note observation in each locality. Among this mission, we try also to conduct longer expedition to place the places that in, in a way have been forgotten by scientists, notably the extreme south of the country. The extreme southern region of Tunisia is known for its difficult and highly um, regulated access, severe, severe weather and geographical conditions such as high 
aridity, extreme temperature, and natural obstacles such as the dunes of the Grand Erg Oriental, which can exceed 250 meters in height, further limit access to the area. This condition explains the rarity of scientific um, uh, studies conducted in this southernmost point of Tunisia. In fact, only five multi multidisciplinary scientific missions have been carried out in that area, the last of which dates back to 1986, 35 years ago. Therefore, it was essential for us to organize a new multidisciplinary scientific expedition to explore the various habitats of this region to collect new data on biodiversity. We were able roughly to give some numbers. We were able to identify more than 11 species of mammals. We followed tracks when possible and we used traps for rodents, which allowed us to capture, for example, species, specimen from the genus Dirbilis. We also were able to observe specimen from the Oryx, Dama, and Adax Nasmaculatis sign of successful reintroduction of both critically endangered species into Tunisia. The oryx dama originally extant in the wild was found uh, uh, to be in a good health with a good body condition and sex ratio. The Barbary sheep, also a vulnerable species, was identified in three localities and showed good body uh, sh shape using camera trap as well. We were able to capture some picture of the remote population of foxes in the deep desert. Sahara, the Sahara is a place where Saharian sedentary species and trans-Saharian paleoarctic migrants meet, meet this vast territory, which represents more than half of the country, has few permanent or temporary natural water resources. Trans-Saharian migrants must make stops in the middle of the deserted ring. The team was able to observe 82 bird species, 53 were migratory species, and 29 were sedentary nesting species. Of the sedentary species, 16 had strictly Saharan distribution, including the Temenix, Hornet Lark, Crowned Sand Grouse, White Crowned Peter, and Desert Sparrows. The expedition also recorded two rare migratory species, the red-breasted flycatcher and semi-colored flycatcher that are rarely seen in Tunisia during migration. Despite the important role of terrestrial invertebrates in ecosystem and the ecosystem services they provide, this group remains poorly known in Tunisia and its inventory is still a fundamental step. The extreme south of Tunisia is no exception to this rule, given that the various missions carried out previously in this region have reported very little data or even none of the diversity of terrestrial invertebrates. A total of 317 specimens of invertebrates were recorded during this expedition and identification resulted in 15 species. This data constitutes one of the few records of entomological diversity in the region. The, the presence in Burj, in Burj al Khadra of, uh, of the Lindania Drafila, the one on the top right of these pictures, uh, which is classified as a critically endangered species uh, by the, the IUCN in North Africa, constitute an, an undeniable argument for the conservation of this sporadic wetland in the desert. Our team is also dedicated to investigate the rich biodiversity found in ancillary ecosystem, and we have had the privilege of working in several of these unique environments. Tunisia home to approximately 50 islands offer a fascinating opportunity to explore species that are found nowhere else on earth. During our expedition to Galit Island, we had the chance to study the rare subspecies of the lacerted lizard, Samadrumis algeris durier, which is endemic to the small islet of Galiton and Fouchel in the archipelago. This sub subspecies has never been deeply investigated before, and we suspect that it could be a new species for science. We're going through the genetic analysis, comparing with the coastal co population to see whether it is the case. The, the, this unique population is particularly threatened by the presence of rats in the island. Further efforts are being established to assess these threats as we embark our mission, our mission to conserve this unique subspecies and their habitat, we hope that our research will, be, will contribute to the development of a proper conservation plan to ensure their continued uh, existence. Through this project, we also aimed uh, to promote research in ancillary ecosystem, and we were honored to have Professor Jonathan Lassos from the University of Washington at San Luis and Professor Pafilis from uh, Asian University to share their remarkable research on a knowledge on Caribbean islands and lesser to in Greek islands. 
respectively island offer wonderful opportunity to, opportunities to study evolution and ecology and we hope that more researchers will consider the Tunisian, uh, Tunisian island as a valuable source of knowledge for their, for their research. <clears throat> the Tunisian Association for Wildlife implemented also a project to improve knowledge of freshwater biodiversity and promote the value of freshwater ecosystem services. The project adopted an integrated approach including the creation of a local support group for management containing local status structure association and, and the local population. The installation of the uh, El Barak Dam, which is one of the biggest dams in, in Tunisia in the 1990s has led to changes in the region, region's biodiversity to, to, due to reduced river flow, sediment accumulation, and isolation of species. In addition, the demographic structure in the region and socioeconomic activity have, uh, have uh, ent intensified, leading to the intensification of agriculture and fishing and other threats such as pesticide use, wildfire, and habitat degradation. After conducting 41 field mission, we collected more than 8,679 data observation on the fauna and flora of the K area for biodiversity in this region. We identified 1,088 different species and subspecies. Among these species, 28 are endemic and 23 species who are classified on the red list, including one critically endangered, two endangered, 11 vulnerable, and nine new resurgent species. We were also able to record for the first time in Tunisia, five new records, among them two, two, two species of spiders that are subject now for a new publication. We also were able to find the newly described and the only tree frog species that exists in the country, which is Haila Cartesian seed. The local support group for management formed as part of this project was trained on monitoring and biodiversity monitoring, including point count methods for birds and stalling nests for capturing both birds and bats, insect trapping, how to conduct morphological measurement, how to follow mammal track, and how to collect data on biodiversity and use them for their future planning in the region. We did so by conducting multiple field visits joint between our specialists and the local support group. So as we, as we tell people in Tunisia about the existence of otters in, the, in their country, we are often met with surprise and confusion. Many have never he heard of the, this fascinating creatures before. Even within the scientific community, information about otters in North Africa is scarce. The only study conducted on the species was carried out in 1982 by MacDonald and Manson, who visited Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia and marked the presence of otters in all three countries. In Tunisia, their distribution was found to be related to the up north of the Majorda River, which is the biggest river in Tunisia. However, for many years, we didn't have clear evidence that they still exist in the region, except for occasional lo local observations that are sometimes confused with mongooses. Such observations are not always reliable from a scientific and academic standpoint. In 2019, we were able to find uh, a first proof of their existence. We found the roadkill. We collected the specimen and conducted an autopsy with the help of our veterinary, Shauke Najjar. We tried to preserve what we could and wrote a short note for update, to update the scientific community about it. Uh, about our findings. We also reached out to the Otter Survival Fund to conduct a webinar to del deliver more information about the species for researchers in the region. Investigating otter in the North African region is interesting, not only at the genetic level, but also in terms of how they survive in arid and semi-arid ecosystem at the southern edge of their distribution. This is particularly noteworthy in Algeria and Morocco, where the species goes deep into the streams of the Atlas Mountains the isolation of the species in this region could potentially lead to speciation compared to European and Asian uh, population. In 2021, we were able to film for the first time in Tunisia an otter in, in its natural habitat, as you, you will see in this short ca camera trap video. Uh, 
it's it's not much, but it's not it's enough to for us to tell that that's indeed an otter, and uh, it it feels good to have the first footage of this species in its natural habitat in in northern Tunisia. So during our expedition, we have developed the habit of stopping whenever we come across roadkill to document the observation and, and if possible, to conserve the specimen. It was during one of these stops that we stumbled upon the otter. Uh, this inspired us to launch the first wildlife focused citizen science project in the country. We created a social media group dedicated to the cause and asked people to share their observations. We were thrilled to receive a high volume of response, which led us to develop an application to stream to streamline the data collection process. We were able to secure funding to conduct a pilot project in NIFSA. The project involved mapping hotspots of road kills incident to identify potential corridors that could be established to mitigate the impact of local wildlife. We also shared our findings with the authority and explained how to use the application to contribute with their observation, hoping that future planning would take similar consideration into account. As we observed road kills, we also kept an eye on trained species on the beaches. Seabirds, for example, play a crucial role in marine environments, serve, serving as important biological indicator. A large-scale operation has been launched to inventory and assess the, signific the, the, the significant and unusual number of razorbell individuals observed along the Tunisian coast at the end of November 2022. The aim is, th is to locate the stranding site of dead individual, identify the causes of mortality, and analyze the behavior of the living birds in order to prevent potential risks related to the mortality of certain individuals of this species. This process, the, pro the prospecting was conducted at sea and along the coast, coast from the far northwest of the country to the far southeast going along the totality of the coastline. This fast re uh, reaction to the incident was an opportunity to collaborate at a national scale. This was a large scale collaboration among multiple NGOs, governmental agency, research unit, and independent experts. On all surveyed, surveyed sites, we only observed two living individuals. We also found two corpses unstrained out on the beach thanks to the participatory science group Tunsi, social network and fishermen who were the first to report the species presence, we were able to gather all the data concerning the species, whether for living individuals or corpse washed up on the beach. A total of 89 individuals were observed during a 45 days period. Seven individuals out of the 32 dead were analyzed. All analysis confirmed that the species does not carry the H1N1 avian flu agent and that the high probability of mortality is due to fatigue and lack of food. And this probably after a storm in the Mediterranean that made few of the specimen lost their way. Conducting field work in wildlife conservation and ecology can, be, can pose challenges uh, for women in Tunisia due to cultural and social norms and bias. Uh, uh, an opportunity. Traditional and conservative, conservative families may discourage women from working in male dominant fields or being in remote areas, leading to reduced number of women in the field. Additionally, gender bias and discrimination may result in men being uh, given pref preferences for field work position despite women being equally qualified. However, the Tunisian Association for Wildlife is proud of its diverse team and is committed to ensure that fieldwork opportunities are available to everyone. We have successfully formed all, all women teams that conduct fieldwork in better conditions, but, but acknowledge that the issue is still present and needs to be addressed through open discussion and, and action. Through our various activity, we have successfully collected over 10,000 specimens. This collection is of, of, of utmost importance and is one of the most valuable in the country. We created the small laboratory with the necessary material to ensure that specimens are properly stored and maintained, preserving their integrity and quality for future generations to study. The department, the department responsible for the scientific collection is in charge of both terrestrial and aquatic species, recording observation and creating databases. Our collection is open for researchers to consult and students who cannot afford conducting field work. As I said, conservation in Tunisia is not yet a field and most researcher, research laboratories do not support their students financially to conduct field work. 
this is one way for people who do not have that option to still be able to conduct their research. Our commitment to, pre uh, to preserving natural collection has led us to take on, the, uh, take on the responsibility of bringing back to life an old, an old museum in a national reserve in Jbala Khrufa. We had brought in range of specimen from the local biodiversity, creating a comprehensive display that highlights the unique and diverse ecosystem. This major, museum serves as an important educational resources for the local community and their visitors. We also try to communicate about our work through making um, web series like uh, ATVS Discovery, where we illustrated the different the different habitat existing in Northwest Tunisia and their importance uh, for biodiversity. But also we uh, we produce longer documentaries where we go deeper in explaining furthermore the interaction between humans and wildlife. We also experimented with uh, very limited resources. Uh, we tried to, for the first time, to 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 conduct macro photography for insect, and we tried to print those pictures and use it uh, in what I call an express museum, where we go around along with uh, some uh, entomological boxes uh, displaying some of our specimen, and we kind of do a small museum in different events and try to showcase uh, the Tunisian biodiversity for kids and people and kind of raise awareness about, uh, about their importance. Before moving along, I wanted uh, to thank all our funders and partners and all other uh, NGOs that we worked with and in, and independent experts. We, we are very glad that in such short time, we were able to establish a strong and effective network of actors to collaborate on multiple questions related to biodiversity in our country. We are very grateful for that. And um, finally, uh, I wanted to say that in the Tunisian Association for Wildlife, we are passionate to preserve the nature splendor of our country, not just for ourselves, but for, for the generations to come, like master artisan of the Roman era who meticulously arranged colorful tiles to create breathtaking mosaics. We gather the scattered piece of knowledge and experience to form a cohesive and beautiful picture of wildlife conservation. We want that our legacy be a living heritage of vibrant ecosystem and thriving wildlife populations, just as uh, a mosaic requires patience um, and attention to detail our effort to conserve biodiversity demand a similar level of dedication and commitment. And just as a mosaic endures through time, our legacy of biodiversity conservation will hopefully continue to inspire and enrich the lives of those who come uh, after us. Uh, with that, I want to thank you uh, very much for, for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Decher, for this uh, superb overview of the activities of uh, your society and, 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 and all the various things and how fitting that you mentioned also the role and of women members in, in the society, considering that today is International uh, Women's Day, uh, March yeah. 8th, so uh, that's very fitting. Uh, let's see, uh, there's a question by uh, by Martin, uh, who, who really found your talk very inspiring, by the way. And and Martin Nicola is asking about Haila and how um, your Carthaginian Cartag uh, tree frog that you mentioned, how how related is that to Haila meridionalis? Um, do, you, do you know that? Haila meridionalis. So Haila meridionensis is, uh, I think, the only species of tree frog. I don't think it is. Uh, maybe, yeah. Let me let me go back to the picture just to show uh, the species for the people who didn't catch it. Um, yeah, there you go. So Haila meridionensis is the only species. Um, that we saw that exist as a tree species, a tree frog species in Tunisia. But in 2019, um, um, a group of scientists from, from France, I think, conducted a genetic analysis for the North African population and discovered that the population that exists in Tunisia is indeed a separate species. And they give it the Carthaginian 
which is the capital of the Phoenician Empire at that, uh, at that time, which is like still... Uh, Zecher, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt you, but you froze there for a moment. I think it wasn't just me. So uh, can you please repeat uh, again what you were saying? Um, we lost yeah, so, so um, this is Carta, uh, Hyla Cartagensis, which is the only tree frog species that exists in Tunisia. Previously, this species was, uh, was thought to be uh, Hyla meridionalis, uh, but a group of scientists, uh, I think French scientists, conducted, uh, uh, conducted genetic analysis for the North African population and discovered that the population that exists in Tunisia is indeed a separate species. And they give it the name of Carthaginensis as a reference, reference to Carthage, which is the, the capital of the Phoenician uh, uh, Empire, or like Carthaginian Empire at that, at that time. Great, thank you, thank you. I just uh, looked online, and uh, I think there's some molecular studies saying that yeah. they are sister species. So, um, uh, so that's yeah, that's that's good. Uh, uh, Roger Camp is asking about butterflies. How many species of butterflies in Tunisia? Uh, for me, it's very hard to answer that question. I think well, our entomologist would be very, very. Uh, precise about uh, answering those kind of questions. I'm more of a reptile guy. <laughs> so I really don't know how many species of butterfly, but uh, we've seen few of them and we have few of them in our collection. The exact number, I really don't recall. If Well is with us, I think he just came from another exposition in the Southern Tunisia. So if he, if he, he is here, he could uh, share that in the, in the chat maybe. Yeah, so please use the Q&A, not, not the chat. So um, I, I, I don't personally know I, um, how many species uh, of butterflies in Tunisia, but I know there's some really interesting biological phenomena there. For example, the migration across the Mediterranean is, is an amazing phenomena. And I remember uh, as a teenager reading about um, the Painted Lady and how some, uh, some people uh, just in the middle of the Mediterranean, they will find these clouds of Painted Lady cr crossing over. Yeah. Uh, from North Africa to 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 Europe, crossing the Mediterranean. So that's um, uh, so. But I, I'm I'm pretty sure there's a lot of diversity, and uh, keep in mind the diversity of ecosystems and habitat, anywhere from uh, mountains to desert to uh, humid coastal areas. Okay, um, uh, let's see. I'm I'm um, uh, okay. This uh, uh, Facebook page of the uh, I will I will I will post that. That's fine. Um, uh, ecotourism. Yeah, uh, so, Polly, Polly Bentley has a really good question um, uh, about ecotourism in Tunisia. I mean, this is an area that could definitely be developed, in my opinion, uh, to also help fund some of these activities. Um, can you comment on that, Zeha? Yeah. Um, and the other day, I had uh, I had a discussion with uh, Professor Fazel uh, Kaboub. He is like a professor in I think Ohio University, and we talked about ecotourism. And I think uh, in terms of ecotourism in Tunisia, we are missing the point. We still don't have real ecotourism. We have some uh, initiative uh, where people start doing activities in wild area, but those activities are not necessarily um, something that they would um, discover biodiversity or, uh, or natural or ecosystem through those activities. So, uh, um, or like involve local communities and try to uh, understand what's going on in the surrounding. So the activities that they do in those natural places are not necessarily attached to what those places mean. So for example, we won't see much of bird watching. We won't see much of her herping, for example. We won't see much of uh, people who do wildlife photography or, uh, or I don't know, um, um, uh, um, like whale sea uh, sighting or something like that. So um, the kind of activity, I, I wouldn't say that we are on, um, still have like a proper um, ecotourism in, in Tunisia. Okay? There are a few. There are a few activities where uh, they try to involve uh, somehow fishermen, and it was, I think, in my opinion, was good, good initiative where uh, they uh, people can go with fishermen and see what what kind of fish they 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 fish and sustainably and uh, 
have an idea on the marine biodiversity, uh, but I don't know if that's still going, but it's also interesting to, to, to know about. Yeah, very good, very good. I, I agree with that. I think there's a lot of opportunities there and that's something to to promote and, and develop. Um, uh, Julie, Julianne Hargraves has a really interesting question about the impact of prolonged drought on biodiversity. How, 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 how does that work when you have the droughts we often have in, in North Africa? The drought? Yes, the drought, yeah. Yeah, I... I would say a lot of species that are adapted to the arid ecosystem um, wouldn't be maybe as affected as a northern species. Uh, in the north, I know that there are some forests where uh, are where where like highly affected of the drought. Um, we we don't have an exact quantification on how this affected um, affected. Um, like for example, insect biodiversity or or any other kind of uh, taxonomic group. Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm not really aware of like to have inexact information about the drought and biodiversity kind of relationship in a way. Okay, uh, we have a question here also uh, from uh, David Hibbler about. Um, any plans you have for the future of the society? So what plans do you have? That's that's a good question. That's a good question. So um, I feel like, so when we started this uh, association, we were around maybe five or six people. Now we are over 15 person. And all of us are young researchers in our field, including computer science, including anthropology, archaeology, and we try to have this multidisciplinary approach. And we are trying also to bring more people around the idea. And now we are trying to develop a, a strong network where we can effectively work on the national level. Um, among, our, uh, among our goals is to have a great position where we can get involved as a, as a scientist to, in the, like policy making and, um, and the setting strategies and um, um, kind of implement monitoring systems for ecosystem. Uh, for example, one of the ideas that we're thinking about maybe in the future is to um, kind of use bioacoustics as a way to investigate forest diversity and to have a clear indices uh, each season, year's day, and see the trends of biodiversity and kind of follow the activities in national parks and uh, those kind of um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, research. Also, with this uh, scientific collection, we are trying to maybe one day is to one of the, our major goals, like to to have a, a natural history museum in the region, which we still lack, unfortunately. And uh, and uh, we are also planning to form our team members to know more about museology and uh, the way how to conserve specimen, how to process them, how to labor them, how to create database. That's something that also we're, we're trying to work on and, uh, and learn how to, uh, to, to enhance uh, our, our outcome from that. Yeah, that's, that's really an important point you, you brought up there. Um, there is the lack of natural history museum. And I mean, you're starting something there with, with uh, the little museum in Krufa, but yeah. um, there is really no museum in the region. So how, how can we inspire the young people to, to care about biodiversity? Uh, Yasin Jashima has an interesting question, which I think is a topic we discussed before. Is, uh, so in terms of the type of conservation biology uh, work you do, are you using uh, DNA level or species level determinations? And are you uh, he's asking about what kind of conservation biology are you doing? Uh, I don't know if he's referring to the lizard investigation. That's the only one where we're trying to uh, kind of understand what kind of species we have. This lizard never been studied before, and morphologically it shows some difference. And now we're going through, I think, Using microsites in collaboration with the with the lab in in Italy, I think. So and through that analysis, we are hoping to have a new species. 
And if so, I th we think it is very important if this new species is uh, named as a new species, it only exists in a small, two small islands, uh, 60 kilometer away of the Tunisian coast. And those islands are not bigger than two kilometer or four kilometer square. So basically a lizard population in a stone kind of in the middle of the sea. And we think that that lizard is living in a very small uh, trophic system um, and uh, is now threatened by the presence of rats. So we are kind of, if, if named new species and that uh, particular ondimis could be very important for the, for the marine protected area to get maybe more fund and uh, get more interest of people who, who want to conserve that species uh, and or the region through the, through the marine protected area. Interesting. Uh, Max Whitby has uh, a very specific question about maybe you don't know the answer. You're not a bird watcher, also I think. Uh, but uh, any sightings of the Algerian nuthatch, Sita uh, ledanti? Are there any sightings in Tunisia? Do you know that? I don't think so. Um, as far as I remember, uh, in my conversation with our ornithologist Ayman Nefla, I I was asking him the same question uh, about the. Uh, places that he visit maybe in the far northwest of Tunisia on the border with Algeria, like uh, Feja National Park or even like Janduba and Tbarqa. But I don't think that uh, he observed any and he's always like around in the field. So um, I don't think so. All right. Uh, so um, another uh, question here about from Christine Fairfax, a very interesting one um, about the adjacent countries. And do you have any cooperation with adjacent countries, especially with species that cross political boundaries? Migratory that's, a good, species. That's, that's a good question. And unfortunately, no, not yet. But that's in our um, goals is uh, like to have collabor uh, regional collaboration in the North African region, Algeria, Libya, Morocco, maybe we have some exchange of like maybe um, 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 like um, professional development with our few like uh, members of our team who go, went to Morocco to exchange some expertise and knowledge, but we still didn't have any uh, set in place any initiative to work uh, at at in collaboration at at the regional level. We have some collaboration in terms of museology with Italy, which is the opposite country of the Mediterranean in terms of like insect conservation and um, insect uh, 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 specimen preparation and identification. But other than that, no, we still don't have original collaboration, but that's a good point we should work on. Yeah, and, and another a point, I mean, back to the ecotourism um, discussion. So Polly Bentley uh, brings up the question about general trips to learn about Tunisians by diversity. Um, I mean, any any plans there maybe to work with the travel agencies or maybe some of the participants here? Can they get in touch with with um, at AVS through the Facebook page to to inquire about um, maybe organizing some trips or um, these sort of things? So that's one thing that we also were thinking about at some point and to implement it was a little bit maybe harder or we didn't have then enough um, visibility or resources to do but it's in our mind but one thing that we do is whenever we have uh, scientists who are visiting tunisia to conduct research and need to have certain collaboration we usually uh, organize joint uh, expedition and field work and we try to work together toward uh, the goals that they have. Like, for example, if someone is investigating a certain species of lizard and reach out to us, we would go with them and try to work together and like try to involve also um, the, the team to for, in the protocol and all and like collaborate properly on that subject. But also in terms of like conducting herpetology expeditions for people who want to visit as, as like, a, kind of ecotourism. We, we thought about it, but we still didn't uh, have, we don't have like visibility how to do it. But if anyone have any suggestion, we are open to that and we can work on it. 
Yeah, so I put the uh, link to the Facebook page on uh, in the chat. So any of you, please uh, feel free to contact the yes. um, the 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 group there uh, through the the page. Um, I think that's all the questions the Q and A. I have uh, maybe a question for you, Zecher. Also, um, uh, maybe uh, can you say a little bit more about the outreach activities you've done with schools and with with children and all that because i think that's an important aspect of what you've been doing uh, also yeah. putting up posters in schools and raising awareness about biodiversity in general yeah so obviously we've conducted 15 projects i didn't have the time to put everything but that's one thing that i missed which is we worked a lot in raising awareness uh, with um, schools about biodiversity and especially with sea turtles and we we went to various schools to show them the importance of sea turtles and the importance of uh, of their the species uh, um, and the marine ecosystem. We also um, tried to uh, to inform them about uh, biodiversity and tried to show them maybe sometimes the entomological boxes and kind of pique their curiosity in a way. And um, we even developed a board game. Uh, uh, for for like kids to play with and like see the the um, the migration path of sea turtles and how they go to the beach to lay their eggs and all in a in a gamification way. Uh, so raising awareness with with kids was 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 a very important component that we did and we have like teams who are specialized in doing that. But also we kind of try to raise awareness or get in touch. Um, uh, in terms of uh, sea, sea creatures and, and uh, strained, uh, strained uh, sea turtles or dolphins uh, with fishermen uh, who sometimes um, maybe are not very uh, reachable to, to talk with and all, but we, 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 we had some teams who go to, uh, to uh, harbors and, uh, and where fishermen uh, usually work to talk with them and try to to inform them and ask them questions, maybe and uh, and uh, exchange information about uh, 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 any kind of observation that they show in the region. Great, um, Julian Hergrave has another really interesting comment. I'm going to read it. I think you are very brave, as you have to fill massive gaps in information, collaboration, and ecotourism, hands-on collecting plastics, recording, etc will help accelerate the protection of species, I'm sure. It's important also to introduce infrastructures for recycling, education, awareness, community projects, uh, et cetera. So what are your thoughts on this? Maybe uh, comment on that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot to process. I think we, we still have a lot to do. Uh, and in a way, our understanding of ecological issues in Tunisia is still very um, limited uh, to what, like maybe plastic pollution management and kind of a very um, superficial understanding of how, and even like you know that, for example, the uh, the trash management in Tunisia system is failing because we don't have like great strategy on how to deal with that. So um, conservation itself still is not a field, as I said. There is not a field in Tunisia called conservation. There is not jo job opportunity. There is no clear strategy. There is no department that work on it properly. There is no uh, in-field conservation in national parks. So all this um, kind of uh, network and uh, uh, base ground need to be established. So unfortunately today, this effort who are made, and we are not alone, there are other NGOs who are working on this similar uh, subject are um, are like sporadic projects that, that rely on outla out, uh, outside funding, but uh, it's not part of you know a clear big strategy and vision that goes like over five or six years or like a, a governmental strategy. So it's like something that happens for one year and then stop, and then there is another subject, then then stop, and this is good, but it's not the perfect. Uh, thing to do as it's not continuous in a way. I'm not sure if I I, I I answered the question, but yeah, it's a lot to to think about. Yeah, really important topics. Thank you. Um, 
Debbie Evans has a question about uh, plants and fungi. Are you doing anything in relation to plants and fungi? Fungi, uh, not much, but plants, we, we do some, some research. And in fact, we have um, the first specialist in Tunisia with us who studied bri bryophyte. Uh, and she has been able to discover new species for science and a new record for Tunisia. Um, I don't know much about the technical, like the scientific names, but we have uh, Iman bin Osman, who is uh, who just finishes her PhD on studying uh, um, studying uh, um, bryophyte, which which is a very unknown group uh, in in Tunisia. But fungi um, fungi is is also unknown. But recently there was a publication, which is for me the most complete publication um has has have been uh, um has been uh, uh published uh, in uh, i think it 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 has a list of 400 over 400 species and it's the most comprehensive i think it was done by someone who's named riza but yeah i i can share later the link if uh, if they know they want to know more about about the species in tunisia yeah, I remember discussing that with you with uh, with uh, the mushrooms, especially have an economic sort of also dimension, yeah. given that uh, during the right seasons, actually people do buy mushrooms from the local communities and, and there's some really interesting work that could be done there. Uh, great. Um, so let me see, I'm, I'm uh, looking here. Okay, we have we have a question from Morocco, actually from Mohammed Hilmi. He said, great presentation. I'm from Morocco and have participated in monitoring activity of the only Maghreb magpie population in Tunisia in 2019 with my Tunisian colleagues. I think this is Pika Pika or Pika Mauritanica, the magpie, the Maghrebian mag magpie. Uh, and he's asking any news about this endangered population from recent years. Is it doing better? Do you know about it? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think he collaborated with Rida Oni and uh, Ayman Nefla. And there is a single population of that uh, subspecies or species. I don't know what's the status, uh, whether like they finished the genetic analysis or not. I think there was a publication uh, that was published. I don't know if it turned the situation, like the taxonomic situation of the species. But I'm not. I'm, I didn't follow up with that. But I, I know of the of the existence of the project. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I also can share that publication if they didn't find it as well, but I don't remember if they, yeah. It, it, I think it, it's in the chat, yeah, the, the, it's, it's been posted by Martin uh, and Nico. Cool. Great, cool. Uh, super. Uh, okay, one, one, one more uh, question again from uh, Christine is uh, Christine Fairfax, who's asking about the political boundaries, right? So if you already received some funding uh, help with WWF, they may be able to help you form suitable cooperative links with the adjacent countries. So it's a suggestion that um, they, they will help develop those links. Yeah, it could be. We we are collaborating with WWF in some projects that we did. And yeah, that's something to discuss with them. Um, you know, different NGOs have different strategies. So that need to be, you know, discussed and see how things can work, but yeah, in WWF in North Africa, they work uh, pretty well in different countries. And yeah, if they need our help or we can establish something together, it would be nice. All right, fantastic. I think that uh, that's it in terms of the questions. So again, please join me in thanking uh, Zecher and, and, and his team and, and we can wish them uh, all the best for the next phase of developing awareness of conservation biology and biodiversity in Tunisia and the region. So very well done, Zecher. Congratulations.